I'm kind of late to the game on this. It's taken me many years into my experience with the mandolin to realize that most of my favorite bluegrass mandolin players plan out their solos in advance. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, if you listen to some old live recordings of folks like Sierra Hull or Sam Bush or even Chris Thiele and a bunch of other folks, you're gonna hear some similar, if not identical solos on the same song from performance to performance. And not to say that they're not great improvisers, obviously they can change things up whenever they want to, but the fact alone that players of this caliber have spent a lot of time figuring out their ideas in advance should be kind of a, a ding ding moment for anyone else who wants to take their playing to a higher level. Like I said, it took me a while to realize that all my heroes weren't just immaculate improvisers from birth. And it took me even longer to work up the motivation and the courage to try writing my own solos because it's a pretty daunting and mystifying task trying to create something out of nothing and hope that it sounds good. But that's why I wanted to make this video to hopefully pull back the curtain, so to speak, and show you how to do this, or at least how I do it. And it's not too challenging. I think anyone can write a solo. It just takes a little time and patience. And to get you started here, I thought we could write a bluegrass mandolin solo together in real time throughout the course of this video. And we're gonna check out this tune called Billy in the Low Ground, which is a standard bluegrass fiddle tune that we looked at here on the channel recently. There's a lesson video up in the cards above if you haven't heard it. And as we go, I'll try to walk you through my thought process, the nuts and the bolts, and hopefully by the end of the video, we'll have a decent solo to show for it. But uh, it's kind of weird filming this right now and not knowing how it's gonna sound. You'll have to stick around to the very end to see how it turns out. So if you've never done this before, let's talk about some tools that you have in your solo writing toolbox, so to speak. And in the context of bluegrass, there really aren't that many. I think there's maybe seven different tools that I use when writing a solo like this. And first and foremost is melody. I think melody is so important in bluegrass in particular, and I really like the idea of someone listening to your solo in isolation and being able to know what song you're playing over without hearing anything else. So that means it's gonna be really important to have that melody firmly lodged into your fingers and in your mind so that you can reference it from time to time, make variations of it, play it up and down the neck in different octaves, different positions. That's all gonna be ammunition that you can draw from here. Number two is knowing your scales, which is gonna give you the information to make the most logical choices for notes outside of the melody. So for Billy in the Low Ground, we're in the key of C major, which means that you wanna know your C major scale. The C pentatonic scale could also be really helpful. And maybe the C blues scale for a little different sound here. Those scales sound pretty bland and clinical on their own, but if you add a simple pattern to them, it can really make for some interesting melodic material. Check this out. Here is a four note motif that's actually derived from the tune Billing the Low Ground that you can use across the entire C major scale. definitely try to add that into our solo at some point. <laughs> Next, you guessed it, is arpeggios, right? Which is gonna give you the really important chord tones that you might wanna feature at certain points in your solo to have it line up with the chord changes of the tune. And for this tune, there's just four different chords, which means we just need to know four arpeggios. We need to know our C major arpeggio. We also need to know our A minor arpeggio. Your G arpeggio. And then lastly, your F arpeggio. And obviously learning these scales, patterns, and arpeggios and different octaves and different positions up and down the neck is just gonna give you more possibilities to choose from. All right, number five here is rhythms. And since we're writing a solo for a bluegrass fiddle tune, we probably wanna use a lot of eighth notes to fit within this bluegrass context. But don't be afraid to add in some other rhythms like triplets or some longer notes like quarter notes, dotted quarter notes, half notes and the like, just to add some variety and spice to this solo. Now there's also a lot of idiomatic stuff that you can do on the mandolin to add some flair or structure to your solo. For instance, you have double stops, right? Or you could add some cross picking in. Or even some tremolo maybe. So keep all that in mind too. Finally, number seven is licks. Kind of like that, uh, that tremolo lick that I just stole from Sam Bush, right? <laughs> licks are kind of a combination of all those other tools and they're just bite-sized ideas that you might've heard from other players on this same tune or on other tunes. So if you heard something that you really like from another player, don't be afraid to steal it and add it to your own solo. All right, maybe just one more. A bonus tool would be number eight, which is your personal taste. I think you just have to follow your gut when you're writing a solo like this. Don't overthink things. Don't be afraid to draw upon your own musical inspirations and background. So if your favorite player is Bill Monroe, it's okay to write a solo that kind of sounds like Bill Monroe or one like Adam Steffi or whoever it is. It's helpful to have an aesthetic direction and uh, it's all fair game. 
All right, so try to keep all that in mind as we come to actually writing this solo now. For this video, I'll be using a program called Finale, but you can use whatever program you want to, or pencil and paper works fine too. And you don't have to actually write out the solo, but it can be helpful to find a way of documenting your progress so you know what you've come up with so that you can replicate it the same way every time you come back to this solo. And if this is your first time, I would recommend maybe writing it out because it helps to visualize the space you have to fill. Otherwise, it can be pretty easy to drop a beat or add a beat accidentally and lose the form and not be able to play the solo with other people. So what I like to do before even writing anything out musically is to come up with a blank template like this that lays out the exact form of the space I need to fill. So everything's already laid out here on the page. We have an AABB form for Billy in the Low Ground. We have a little pickup measure here, but the first eight measures after that represent our first A section. And then, you know, the A section repeats, but here we have another eight measures laid out for the second A because we want to fill that space with new material to keep this story developing with your solo. The next eight measures would be the first B section, and then the next eight measures would be the last B section with one measure at the end to finish it off if we want to. And uh, at this point, you know, with the, the chords over the corresponding measures, it's almost like bluegrass mad libs, right? You're just filling in the blanks. It's not too bad. So we'll dive right in and starting with this pickup measure, it might be kind of fun to play a longer phrase to get into the solo instead of just playing two notes into the downbeat here on that C note. Maybe we could start high and end up lower and use the pentatonic scale as a way to get down there. So I'll write this out as we go here. I like to write it in standard and then drag it into the tab. Going down the pentatonic scale and then hopping back up to the C. And then from there, maybe we could just start slow, play pretty much the melody. But uh, we could also add in some rhythmic variation there. Maybe we could do a longer note at the beginning. So start off with the C there. I'm walking up to the C here on the A string, starting the A minor with the slide there, like we did in the melody. All right, so for the next two measures, maybe we could get off the original melody a little bit. Maybe use the pentatonic scale again like that. So playing like a open A, is that right? A, G, and then C, A, G, E. Oops, I got the rhythms wrong. Let me, let me try this again. Quarter A, and then we have this pentatonic line. So A, G, C, A, G, E, before we land back down on this C note. That's a really nice target note to tie all that together and make it still sound kind of like we're working with the melody, right? All right, first line down. For the next phrase here, we're starting on the C. And maybe we could add in a little lick here already. This is one. It's kind of a nice chromatic arpeggio. I think I got this from a scale pattern book, Patterns for Jazz. And what we're doing is starting on our root here, playing two notes on the root, playing the fret beneath it back up to the root, doing the exact same thing with your E note. Same thing with your G, even though we're playing some chromatic notes there. Ooh, I like that better. We're Maybe we're walking down chromatically to the A for the A minor chord. So all together, those two measures would be. A little flashy, but hey, it sounds pretty good. Let's write that out. So it's C, C, and then E, E, G, G, F sharp, C, C, B, B flat, down to A. And then what can we do next? Let's see. All right, so on the A minor here, I'm feeling like we should probably go higher and maybe set up the second A section for an octave variation where we're playing kind of the same melody up the octave here. So here, maybe after the open A string, we could do a little slide there up to the high A. That's a nice octave. Maybe, let's see, what could we do? Maybe? Maybe add in a little bit of the blues scale with that flat three. 
kind of like that. What do you think? I'll write that in for now. So the slide, and then the E flat. There we go. All right, so that's the first quarter of our solo. Let's play it and see if it fits together. sounds okay right all right so we just landed on this chord tone C for our C chord here at the end of the second line that's setting us up really well for this octave variation where maybe we could play out of this second position and play a version of the melody maybe with some variations I think I was playing around with the pentatonic scale there again the shape here we have in the second position Let's see if I can play that again Maybe something like that. Let me try that to the C twice. Uh, da, da. And then A, C, C. I think I'm using my ring finger there on the seventh fret. Looks pretty nice though, right? So we have, maybe we could just keep the good times rolling on the pentatonic shape. And add in a little B note in there. I'm just playing around with this double stop shape until we land on this A note for your A minor. So let's see if I can write this out. G, E, G, B. So maybe we could do a hammer on onto that A. That'd be kind of nice. I think that's good. And then maybe like a hammer on triplet. Another one like that. So. Something like that. Yeah, it's all just using the pentatonic scale. So. Da, da. A little triplet here. A little hammer on. All right. Does that make sense? Let's see. All open E, open A strings in there. Oh, you know what? I wrote this out wrong. Let me try to do this again here. I think that works out, right? Yeah, that sounds kind of nice. I'm thinking since maybe we're going down. Could be fun to like keep going down past, you know, the downbeat of the next measure and almost defer the target note, that low C that we would expect for the melody. Let's see if I can write that out. So we start on the G there. Uh, da, 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 mm. And then maybe we can mess around with that motif for a while. Like... Yeah, something like that. What about... Uh... No, almost. Be... Something like that. Da, ba, da, ba, da. Da, uh... A note there. Da, 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 da. Oh, that's even better, like ending it on the A. That's a cool little thing. That way we're landing on that nice root for your A minor chord. Didn't even think it would work out like that. That's really nice. Follow your ear and see what happens, right? Since we've really gotten away from the melody here, let's see if we can get back to the melody here before getting to the B section. So we could do a... That's kind of a nice little button to the end of the A section here. Add our little slide slash in there. Most of this video is just gonna be me rambling about finale. Let's see if we can get through those eight measures. That's interesting, yeah, that deferred resolution, it's different. I'm digging it. All right, halfway there. We are on to the B section. Maybe we could, uh, let's see, what could we do?
So for the next measures, I'm thinking maybe we could do a mandolin specific technique like double stops for instance. So um That'd be kind of nice. So like uh we could do That just kind of came out. Quarter on the E and then we slid up to high double stop here. A little bit of your blue scale, the lowered seventh, which is going to lead us to the F chord. And we did kind of this walk up, chromatic walk up from the F. That sounded all right. Let's try that out. And then we're just going up chromatically here for this last double stop here. Just put some generic slides on these bad boys. All right, so we've got this now. And since we're already up here, why don't we take this second line as an opportunity to play some licks up the neck? Maybe like a... That's kind of a mandolin banjo-y sounding lick, right? So we're playing an E flat to an E natural. And then down to the C there, and then playing another E natural to E flat there. And then just kind of some pentatonic gibberish to get down to the C. Maybe something like that. Maybe that's a nice way to get down to the A for the A minor. Or maybe even delaying the resolution to the A kind of playing around with the C a bit there first. So it would be uh, starting with the C there, sliding down from the G to the F, C, B, A. Ooh, maybe even adding in a little bit of that scale pattern that we talked about before. <laughs> Let's see if we can squeeze that in. Playing this pattern all the way down. Oh, it's developing as I go. Let's see. Maybe we can walk up to the E as well, playing a little C major arpeggio here, and walking up to the E note for the melody in a lower octave there at the bottom. Let's see what that sounds like. So we're playing this pattern over your kind of A minor chord here, and then shifting down to play it over your G chord, and then the last bit's kind of over your C chord. Kind of setting us up to play this melody in the lower octave. That's a lot, right? So let's see if we can play this first B section. <laughs> that actually works pretty well, right? All right, so we'll probably start off with the melody here in our next line. Something like that. Oh, I have an idea. What if we use that kind of ragtime rhythm to play a few double stops ascending back up to the higher octave? Let's see if we can make that work. So be like. Ooh, what if we had like another little chromatic double stop in there to tie it together with our earlier double stop idea? Does that work? Let's see. I think we can make that work. Let's see. We'll get through the double stop here and see how we can resolve it. So we're playing kind of this double stop shape with a rag rhythm. Doing kind of a similar rhythm over the A note on your seventh fret. Tied rhythm over the bar line. Then we have this kind of chromatic motion going up to the F chord. Or maybe we could do something like that. That'd be kind of fun. No, no, that's too weird. That's too weird. We're not going to use that. <laughs> That's another important thing. You want to make your solo sound natural. And if it sounds weird while you're playing it slowed down like this, then um, it's probably not worth keeping. <laughs> Maybe something like that though. Like... Get into the, the higher melody there. That could work. Let's see. Just using that G sharp as a way of getting up to the A note, which is your chord tone for F. Ooh, 
Ooh, I like that. So maybe pause on the quarter note there. Just a few repeated notes there, some different rhythms. Da, 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 da. And then back to the melody here. Da. A little slide there on the second beat, forgot about that. This would be the fifth fret there, that's better. And then on to the last line. We are so close, we are so close. I kinda like the idea of using the blues scale a little bit more to bring out kind of an angular sound here for an exciting finish. Maybe we could do, um, or maybe we could play the melody for the first two measures here. That way, you know, we have a little bit more context for what's going on. Do that rag rhythm again. So many possibilities, it's hard to choose. Ooh, I got an idea for an interesting lick using some open strings, maybe. Does that sound good? It's not the blues scale, but it's pretty chromatic and angular, right? We're just walking up to some chord tones chromatically. Maybe walking up with the arpeggio at the end there. I like it. We're going with it here to finish out strong. Yeah. Yes. I think we did it. I think we did it. Oh my goodness, that was amazing. And um, hopefully future David has actually figured out how to play this and can give you an example of what it sounds like all together. So take it away, future David. One, two, one, two, three, four. That's actually not too bad, right? It kind of sounds like Billy in the Low Ground. It's got some interesting ideas in there, different rhythms, some scales and arpeggios and licks and all that stuff we talked about. Um, hopefully it gives you some insight into what's going on inside my head while I do this and can hopefully break down some of the imposter syndrome that we all feel when coming to a big project like this. Anyone can do it. You're gonna learn so much through doing it. And the more you do it, the faster and the better you're gonna get at it. So I try to remind myself that every solo I write is a good solo because it's gonna get me to the next one and the next one and so on. And the weird thing is I think doing this actually makes you a better improviser in the long run. All the great improvisers out there are actually using the exact same tools that we use here. They're just assembling things in a rapid fashion. And the more you do this, the better you're gonna get at doing this off the cuff as well. So. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was helpful. If you want a copy of this PDF transcription for the solo that we just wrote, you can grab it over on Patreon and try this out with a fiddle tune of your own choice as well. I'm excited to hear what your results are and I'll see you in the next one.